Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity. My name is Ken Tenser, CEO of SpiderWorks, a leading business consultancy for mid-market organizations and entrepreneurs globally. With me today is Erthrin Cousin, CEO of Food Systems for the Future, an organization founded to catalyze, enable, and scale market-driven food tech to improve nutrition outcomes by making nutritious food affordable for low-income and underserved communities. Like this video if you enjoy our show and subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment with who we should interview next. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the show. Earth and Cousin, welcome to Say Hi to the Future. Hello and thank you very much for having me on the show. So Earthrin, I you know, just for the sake of the listeners and viewers, I, I looked at even just a few of your bio points. Former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Agencies for Food and Agriculture, uh, CEO of American Second Harvest, Executive Director of World Food Program, and now the founder and CEO of Food Systems for the Future. And again, that's a small sampling, but when <laughs> I when I see that, I actually don't see a career. I see a calling. And wh where did that passion come from? Because it is. It is longstanding in your efforts, and it seems very, very focused. Well, a calling. <laughs> you know, I won the birth lottery. And what does that mean? You know, I was born into a family of joyful, giving, forgiving, and compassionate people, particularly my parents, who believed in family, service to community, service to country. And uh, they brought us up to believe that to whom much is given, much is required. And uh, that did not mean that you necessarily needed to live a life of public service because my siblings did not choose public service. But it also it did mean that if you did not choose public service, it meant that you were committed to investing some of your time and treasure into community, into uh, support for others. Um, I my mom was uh, a social worker um, for her entire career. And I often say my dad was a community organizer before Barack Obama made it popular. <laughs> uh, he was someone who was, he never ran for public office, but every public official in my neighborhood knew him and spent time at my dining room table with him, talking to him about what was necessary to support because they knew that he was one of those people that any good politician wants in their camp. Someone who is going to stand up, bring their children to support. Uh, I said I was passing out pamphlets on election days long before I could <laughs> vote. Uh, but you grew up knowing that you had a responsibility for voting because um, so many in our country had died to ensure that people who looked like us could exercise that right to vote. I, you know, let me just tell you quickly, when the, in some families get turning 16 and getting a driver's license was a celebration. I didn't get a driver's license until I was 25, but I was registered to vote the day I turned 18. They took us into, they took you down to the voter registration office and we talked about candidates and elections and participating. So all of that was very much a part of, of my upbringing and what I believed in as I grew up. And I had a grandmother, my dad's mom, who lived downstairs from us, who never met a stranger who if there was a hungry person in our neighborhood, they always knew they could knock on her door and she'd feed them. 
I, I never said I was going to go, I, I want to ensure that everyone has access to food. I knew that I wanted to, to provide support to making, to, to, to addressing the challenges that, that others were, were experiencing. Because I, I, I guess the, the bottom line is I was born a humanitarian. And what does that mean? A humanitarian is someone who takes, who has an active belief, an active belief in the value of every human life. And so for me, that took the form of working as a lawyer early in my career. I, 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 I attended law school. I practiced law for a while and in, in a more traditional sense and, and working with women who were in abusive relationships uh, mm -hmm. and moved from that into working in government agencies to support affirmative action, to provide access to business and opportunity and investments that were not previously available, to working in campaigns at the state, local, and federal level. Um, and then to con that work continued when I left the Clinton administration to go to Jewel Food Stores as their director of government affairs, I also became a member of the Board for International Food and Agriculture to support the investment and development of agricultural systems. And so I was getting pulled more and more into this food piece. And what I learned was that there were, what we had a need for grocery stores in inner city communities. And I worked with Jewel Food food stores to help build many of those grocery stores. Jules was bought by Albertson. Albertson's quickly promoted me to senior vice president for food for uh for for community outreach and as the chief communications officer of the company. I was responsible for doing what I the work that I performed in Chicago across the country to help identify opportunities for building stores in underserved communities. And as you said, then that led to my work with Feeding America. So I was, as as I was committed to making change and supporting human life and supporting the ability of families to live life to their full potential, I was pulled more and more into this food space. Um, and as you said, it was, it, it was, a, I, I am a person of great faith and I follow where my mind and my heart leads me. And what I continue to build on was this work in providing access to nutritious food for those who, particularly for those who did not have the ability to access. And, mm -hmm. and, and that work continued to build upon uh, one experience built upon another. And I remember when I was sitting before the, the, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and, and, and Senator Durbin was introducing me to the committee and talked about the work that I, I performed to provide access to nutritious food, the work that I performed in, in with Feeding America and the, my commitment to ensuring access to food for, for those who, who were suffering from, um, from hunger and malnutrition at home as well as internationally. And I, 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 when I listened to him walk through this litany of my career, I, I was, it, I, I was, I paused and it, it forced me to think for a second that this was not planned. It was one building block after the other as opportunities became available and I seized them to make a difference in the lives of others. And that is how I have, have functioned in this career. That is how I've worked to deliver, to make a difference. And as you say, it is, it is, it is a calling and it is not a job. It is my life. Well, it sounds like an absolutely beautiful life um, that you're living in and giving back to so many. And the tie back, I, I, I love stories going back to the inspiration of parents and grandparents and, and that work. I just think it's, it's so important that 
you know, what we learn and see is, is children really do carry us mm -hmm. through our lives and really do shape us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing I really learned, though, throughout all of my work, one one lesson I've I've taken from so much of my work is that I've never met a mother, whether in Nairobi, Kenya or on the west side of the city of Chicago, who wanted to stand in a line to feed her family. Right. And providing the investments in the market-based um, businesses that can increase the access to affordable, nutritious food, provide jobs, and build wealth in communities is why I started the Food Systems for the Future. Mm -hmm because I wanted us as a, as a community of actors to move beyond, yes, providing that social safety net for people who when they fall through the cracks, we know that they have access to nutritious food, but performing the preemptive emergency humanitarian action by investing in communities, investing in businesses, scaling up businesses, providing opportunities to increase the capacity of business, the partnerships and the policies that will give those a market-based system the ability to, to, to provide food at an affordable and nutritious price everywhere for everyone. And that was why I started Food Systems for the Future. I've been an entrepreneur for 30 out of my 37 years working. And I've got to say that even at your level, taking that leap must have, you know, there must have been a few moments of, boy, this is going to be a different journey. It's going to be a phenomenal one. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how do you find, you know, how do you make that final decision? Or was it just, again, something you needed to do on your journey, something that you felt empowered? To do. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture. There's no one aha moment that says, this is what I'm going to do tomorrow. After, when I left the, when I finished my tenure at the World Food Program, I went out to Stanford University uh, as, a, as a distinguished fellow and had the opportunity to do research around the, the work of, of, of what created a sustainable food system. Where were the gaps in some communities versus others that limited the availability of affordable nutritious food and uh, with support from Rockefeller, BCG, Stanford um, and lots of friends uh, from the from the community who who provided input into our original landscape work I we recognized that the challenge was that um, there were communities across the, the United States, as well as across the globe, where mm -hmm. capital did not flow and where not meaningful capital did not flow. There are all kinds of businesses. Nobody starts more businesses indeed in the United States on an annual basis than black women. But those businesses are undercapitalized. They, are, they, they lack the capacity to scale. And so we have the exact same problem in Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Latin America and even today in parts of Asia, where the capital for scale of businesses is absent. And so that having that ability to see what was necessary, I began to say, I can build, I can fill that hole, that gap, right. I, we can create the organization that can that can provide that capacity, that capital, to 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 change the the opportunity for scale of these businesses that would, as a result, change the availability and affordability of 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 good food for for people in these communities, while also and as an entrepreneur, you'll understand this, providing the financial return that was necessary for those right. who would invest, as well as making that impact that we were, were working to achieve. And you're right. There were mornings there. And, and honestly, even today, there are mornings when you wake up and you say, 
why did I decide to do this? <laughs> it is the hardest, it is the hardest challenge I've ever embraced in my entire career. It, because it is one thing when you have people who uh, have already committed financial resources to a project or to a business um, and you are coming, even when you are coming in to lead, uh, that 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 fully financed uh, facility, uh, it is quite different than when you are leading a facility with significant uh, opportunity, but you are also convincing and raising the resources to support this vision. Uh, and then, as I said, there are days when you say, maybe I'm not the right person. But uh, I, I always go back again that I would not have been given these gifts and the experiences that uh, I've uh, that I've achieved to date um, if I had if 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 there was no greater purpose. Well, I and I, I think that's so critical. And, and um, I had the opportunity to speak to a CEO or a former CEO of one of the most recognizable companies in the world. And he talked about this sort of post-corporate life that he was in is his move from success to significance. Mm -hmm. and, and I just found that, you know, it was just one of those trigger moments where you're going, yeah, that having purpose, giving back, leveraging everything the world has given to you to help others is just an amazing point of life to be in. I I feel as if I I am I am stepping into a void that if it was easy to fill, someone else would have done it right already. And with the experiences and the success that I've been that I've been blessed to to have to date, I am that someone. When I look at food systems for the future, and I, I think one of the things that struck me was, and, and again, it comes down to being, smaller and nimble is that you uh, you address the problem differently in different parts of the world if i mm -hmm. understand it correctly like in the u.s you're looking at investing in scaling black and latinx led food and ag tech mm -hmm. um, enterprises sub-saharan africa is more about resilient just and sustainable food systems so that that must be a real gift as well to be able to not not look at the problem as nutrition or better nutrition or affordable, but to look at the sub problems, to look at the core mm -hmm. of the root mm -hmm. and be able to uh, address them differently as a situation calls for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So often those of us who work at the international level believe that if, if, if see every problem uh, because they have a hammer, they see every problem as a nail. <laughs> um and and the one thing one of the many lessons many lessons that I've 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 learned throughout this career is that context is important that um and and that whether you're talking about how we the different soils around the world and what is necessary to farm in those different mm -hmm. soils or you're talking about people around the world mm -hmm. the goals are the same what is holding them back, the structural challenges that must be addressed are different and unique in every single one of those situations. It does not mean that some of the tools that you use in one place you won't use in others, but it means that you must evaluate the challenges that th that community, that particular context is, is, um, is must overcome um in order to provide the the appropriate tools from that toolkit that you bring um and as you said i would know i i i when i started the work in the, the thinking about the what would where would food systems for the future operate when i was out at stanford um we 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 looked at international and we focused on sub-saharan africa we actually looked across the globe as part of our landscaping and we have thoughts about other uh, areas outside the continent 
Uh, but there, the, the Africa is 52 countries. And when we talk mm -hmm. about context, what is necessary in each one of them is quite different. And so we decided that that in and of itself was a place where we wanted to begin. But I was getting so much pushback, particularly from my students out at Stanford who would say to me, how can you focus over there when we have so many problems here at home? particularly in the Black and Latinx communities mm -hmm. that are not being addressed. And I heard them. And so I'm even more ambitious, we'll build two teams, a team in the U.S. and a team in Sub-Saharan Africa, with each one of them with the, the talent and the tools to support the context of the problems that are we're, that, that, we, that we will address in each of these areas. Thank you for that. And I'm only chuckling because I, I am going to take that, that answer, the word context, put it in a, on a loop for some of my students in the corporate strategy that I also <laughs> teach, because all the time when they start into it, they, they start talking about the challenge. And I say, don't talk to me about the challenge. Talk to me about the context in which the challenge lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to just put you on a loop <laughs> my next class. Well, that's basic problem solving. And unfortunately, um, historically, that has not been a consideration of ours. We, mm -hmm. we, we always have what we call donor directed solutions. What is a donor paying me to do? Right. And so I would we would go into communities and bring that donor directed solution that had little to do uh, to oftentimes with the actual structural challenges that that community was facing. And as a result, as long as we were there, the programs were operating. As soon as we right. moved on to the next program, that program ended. Because the community was not, the, the community did not value the work that we performed enough to continue that work once the donor dollars were no longer available. Because it was not addressing the specific problem that, mm -hmm. um, that they were looking to achieve, that they were looking, that they were experiencing. Yes, it's a very real challenge, and, and I'm glad that you have the ability to work a little bit outside of that now. Um, mm -hmm. Because context, too, I mean, if we look at it in terms of food, food crisis, nutrition, it, it, it obviously doesn't live on its own. I mean, contextually speaking, climate change, mm -hmm. the capacity mm -hmm. to, to grow food, whether it's outside or whether it'll be inside, especially in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, you must be dealing with so many macro trends, so many macro mm -hmm, issues mm -hmm. in, in understanding and determining next steps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we talk about food and agriculture when we should really talk about food systems because the food system is the system that is most vulnerable to the climate crisis that we are facing today. Um, and, and the the real dichotomy and challenge here is that the food system is also one of the major contributors to the climate crisis that we are uh, uh, facing today. And so we must create a food system when we think about the solutions, as I, as you and I've been discussing this morning, when we must think about them in the context of creating an equitable, sustainable food system. And that means it, a system that meets our environmental needs, our human health needs. We've been talking about that good food to ensure that people have access to affordable, nutritious food, but also that provides for the economic and financial return to all of the stakeholders across the food system, from the farmer to the investor who invest in that food system. And that is how we will create that system that is sustainable and resilient to the challenges of climate conflict and to even, I would argue, to future pandemics. Uh, because the food system that we had, what we learned was it was, well, here, even here in the United States, while efficient, was not agile. And as a result, it was unsustainable and lacked resilience. Mm -hmm. 
And so when we think about the, the solutions that we are investing in across that food system, whether it's at farm level or in the processing of food or in the, re, the, the warehousing the, the, and wholesale and retailing of food and ultimately in how we address issues related to food waste. Uh, all of that must be thought through a sustainability lens that builds the resilience in the food system. You know, when you talk to that and um, your your research lead, uh, Cedric, Cedric was on our show. He's, he was a, a guest early last year and he sp spoke a lot about resilience, a lot about quinoa um, mm -hmm. and its capacity to, to provide nutrition and, and that mm -hmm. it's a resilient crop. Is that a very large part of what you do to look for the, the type of crops that can sustain, that can be mm -hmm, resilient mm -hmm, in, in different mm -hmm, parts of the world? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, food systems for the future, we work at the macro level and at the micro level. And we've been talking about our micro level work, the work mm -hmm. that we do with businesses and in, uh, in, in the U.S. And, and right now in Rwanda. But at the macro level, it is so important that we build the, the, the architecture, the food systems, and there are a number of food systems architecture mm -hmm. that supports the investment in, because we right now we have $700 billion in subsidies across the globe. Much of them are, are supporting the, the, a, a food system that is creating some of those environmental challenges that we talked about. And we lack the investment in the crops that are necessary to okay. support that the environmental um, the, the sustainability as well as 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 the um, as well as the nutrition um, that the, we need for human health. And so that conversation at the at the macro level is so critical uh, to ensure that the, the right resources are available at the micro level to support those crops. And what do I mean? Even here in the United States, we consider fruits and vegetables as specialty crops. And they don't receive the subsidies and support that we give to commodity crops. And the challenges with the subsidies that we have today is not only do we not invest in those specialty, what are considered specialty crops, the fruits and, and, and vegetables and the more nutritious foods, but we invest in commodity crops. And as a result, those commodity crops um, can we we consume sixty percent of, of 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 commodity crops in our in, as part of our diet, um, and and those commodity crops are corn, wheat, rice, and soy. As a result, the we have the the health challenges that I've spoken about, the environmental challenges, and we lack the financial resources to all for all of the actors across the food system. So changing those policies, changing those pr priorities across the globe is so critical to ensuring that at the national level and at the local level, we are driving the policies that are necessary to support those more, um, those crops that can change our environmental output from agriculture, as well as the access to affordable uh, more affordable good food uh, and, and nutritious food. Earthrun, thank you um, so much for this uh, conversation this morning. As our time comes to an end, I mean, it's just been, it's been short, but it's been fascinating. And, and understanding, again, your calling, your passion, your, your, your look at something on a macro level across the world, boiling it down to micro, giving yourself the capacity through, and I'll call it entrepreneurship, to, <laughs> to, to look and bring things together as, as you'd like. And I, I, I think I completely understand. I'd be remiss not mentioning this, but um, it's it's early in uh, your journey for mm -hmm. for um, uh, food systems, which food systems for the future. But you've already won a, an incredible award, mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. 2022 Institute of Food Technologies Grand Prize, and that goes to um, inspiration, supporting innovation, diversity, and multidisciplinary teams. So. Congratulations on that. And just, just as, as, as we wrap up today, tell us a little bit about 
you know, what, what were the, the, the one or two things that really broke through to, to gain you that mm -hmm. recognition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. And, and I, I get, this is an opportunity for me to publicly again, thank the team at IFT for their belief in our vision. Um, and what we want, where we, uh, we received the award for our work in Rwanda, uh, where we are working to address the, the, the challenge of feed in the poultry sector and in the aquaculture sector that will provide for the, the scale up of the, of the, of each of those sectors and ultimately result in a lower cost of, of eggs and, 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 and fish protein for the population. Uh, and how are we doing that? By bringing innovation to scale in sub-Saharan Africa, changing the attitude that you can only do projects, that you cannot do innovation and automation uh, at, the love, at the same level that we do in Europe and the United States in sub-Saharan Africa. We must leapfrog the challenges of creating the, ty the, the, the food system changes that are necessary on the continent, just as we must, we must continue to build innovation in the developed world, we must also bring those, to, in, those innovations to the developing world. And we, with the support from IFT, are, are, are working to accomplish that goal uh, in Rwanda with a black soldier fly larvae facility that we are bringing online there that that will substitute for soy in the in the feed system and provide taking food out of the feed system, bringing the cost of feed down and providing an opportunity for farmers to produce eggs and fishermen to grow um, um, aquaculture programs that can ensure every child has access to affordable, nutritious food by solving the structural problems. That gets us right back to where we were before. <laughs> Understanding the context, solving the structural pro problems, making a difference that create that resilient food system. What a beautiful place to end, Earther. And thank you for your time. Thank you for all of the work you do. And, and, and let's say thank you for your parents and grandparents for instilling this <laughs> absolutely um, incredible fire and passion into you because um, yeah, nobody does it alone. And that is the truth. That is okay. the truth. Thank you. Take care.